Hello, I'm Nick Fogarty, Archaeology Curator for History Nebraska, and today we're going to do an unboxing video with History Nebraska's archaeological collections. This is the collection from 25SM4, which is from Sherman County, Nebraska. We use a system for identifying sites called the Smithsonian Trinomial System, which works by assigning a number to each state, Nebraska is 25, SM stands for Sherman County, and the 4 re refers to the fact that this was the fourth site in the county uh, numbered with this system. This site was excavated in 1931. Based on diagnostic artifacts like pottery and the shape of the house at the site, we can say pretty conclusively that the site was occupied by what archaeologists refer to as Central Plains Tradition people. These people were farmers that lived in villages from about 1,000 years ago to about 600 years ago. This was the most populous time in the region until Euro-American settlement. Let's see what we can learn about these people from the objects we have in this box. Box 1. Pottery. Here we have some pottery recovered from the site. The pottery in this box can be divided into two types, rim sherds and body sherds. The rim sherds are where we find the most intensive efforts to decorate, and they can also give us an idea of the shape of the complete vessel. Box 2. More pottery. In this box, uh, we have some rim sherds, some of which are more photogenic than the ones we looked at before. This rim sherd has a collared rim with incised designs on the rim. The surface decoration is fairly typical. We call this surface design cord marked, and it comes from a paddle wrapped in some sort of cordage like twine. We aren't exactly sure how these pots were made, uh, but we can say for sure that they were not made using coils of clay. Uh, the cord wrapped paddle along with some sort of anvil placed on the interior of the pot seems to be the way these pots were shaped and thinned. This one displays a similar but different surface treatment. The cord markings on the exterior of this pot have been smoothed over, but they are still there. This one also has incised lines on the rim, but these are made with a piece of cordage like what was used to make the surface treatment. Here is another thing about this pottery that is worth mentioning, is that it shows how curatorial standards have changed over time. What we commonly see with older collections is that at some point in the past, these artifacts were glued to cardstock, which we don't do anymore. Box 3. Bone and Shell Objects Speaking of objects glued to cardstock, we have some objects made from bone and shell here. Fishing was an important source of food for Central Plains tradition people. Here we have two fragmentary fish hooks that were made from bone. On this card, we have three pieces of cut bone, a shell bead, and a piece of bone with a hole drilled in it. The three smaller bones are presumably beads. On this other card, we have two fragments of worked bone and a piece of worked shell. The shell is likely a bead or pendant blank. We also have a couple of fragments of a tool that is commonly called a quill flattener, although there isn't much evidence of it being used in that context. What we can say is that based on the context of these examples and others, that it had a domestic use, perhaps pottery production or weaving. This is a bone awl, which is a tool that should be familiar to almost all of us. My Swiss Army knife has one of these. It is a hide working tool used for making holes suitable for sewing. They're commonly made from the forearm or lower leg bones of large mammals. Box 4. Freshwater Shells These are freshwater mussel shells, which weren't just a source of material to make things like beads, but also an important food resource. Box 5. Chipstone Tools a modest amount of chipstone tools were recovered from the site. The chipstone tool assemblage is mostly focused on cutting and scraping activities with one projectile point in the collection. Many of the tools are simply flakes struck off a larger piece of lithic material. Many also have evidence of resharpening along their working edges. Some though, like this end scraper, are more patterned. These two objects are called bifaces by archaeologists, because unlike, say, this flake that has been retouched on one surface, these bifaces have had flakes struck off both the top and bottom surfaces. And that concludes our look at the collection from 25SM4. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about what you'd like to see from us in the future, let us know in the comments below.